My name is Barbara Velasquez, and it's my honor to welcome you to Native American Heritage Month programming at Metropolitan Community College. Today's program is offered in hybrid fashion with in-person audience at the Fornum Hawk Campus Building 10 in the newly re renovated room uh, with great audio sound. So we're excited to be here. We appreciate the time that everyone's taking to join us today. And also Sarah is generously allowing us to record. So if you would like to watch again or share her presentation with anyone else, watch for a post in a couple of weeks of the recording at mccneb.edu slash native or on MCC's YouTube page. And if you have trouble finding either of those, you can always connect back to me, Barbara Velasquez. Bor borrowing from the White House Proclamation for Native American Heritage Month are the following passages. Since time immemorial, Native communities have passed down rich cultures, traditions, knowledge, and ways of life. But throughout our history, Native people's cultures, identities, and governments were not always seen as a part of this nation, but as a threat to it. Native people were pressured to assimilate, banned from practicing their traditions and sacred ceremonies, and forced from their homes and ancestral homelands. This violence and devastation cost countless lives, tore families apart, and caused lasting damage to tribal communities and institutions. Despite centuries of violence and oppression, Native peoples remain resilient and proud. Native Americans are essential to the fabric of the United States. They serve in the United States Armed Forces at higher rates than any other ethnic group. They continue to steward so many of our great lands. Their contributions to science, humanities, arts, public service, and more have brought prosperity for all of us. Their diverse cultures and communities continue to thrive and lead us forward. Sarah White, Oglala Lakota, is the founder and executive director of the South Dakota Education Equity Coalition, SDEEC. She has eight years of experience working and advocating for Title VI Indian education programs, working at Rapid City Area Schools in South Dakota and at Omaha Public Schools in Omaha, Nebraska. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, a master's degree of education degree from Creighton University and a PK-12 administrator endorsement from the University of South Dakota. Sarah is a passionate advocate of indigenous education whose work seeks to elevate the urgent narrative of indigenous education through the lens of community. Her desire in this role is to create a cohesive and collaborative effort to identify and implement solutions that address our shared concerns regarding Indigenous education. Sarah is a mother to four sons. Please welcome Sarah White, who will present the fight for Indigenous education. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Barbara. Um, Thank you all for coming today and thank you all for tuning in via Zoom. It's really, it's an honor to be back in Omaha today. Um, Omaha holds a special place in my heart for a multitude of reasons. Um, one being that the, the start or the genesis of my professional career began here following um, my graduation from Creighton and then embarking on what would ultimately be um, the change in trajectory of my professional career at Omaha Public School District. So as Barbara mentioned, I served um, as the director of Title VI Indian Ed Programming at the NICE program, so the Native Indigenous Centered Education Program with the Omaha Public School District. And it was through that experience um, that my eyes were open to these both starkly contrasted but um, array of challenges that our urban native youth fo face in classrooms across cities across the United States. Um, I was born um, in Rapid City, South Dakota and was raised in Rocky Ford, South Dakota. So the badlands of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, and Rocky Ford is a small town that you will not find on any maps or rarely any maps. Um, but we're in, in what I call God's country of our community. And so being, having been raised there, um, I was blessed and afforded a lot of opportunities to 
um, connect with my surroundings, my natural surroundings, um, and just be raised in a slower environment than a lot of students had an opportunity to do so growing up. Um, but I digress a little bit. Before I jump right in, I will say that I am the queen of tangents. Um, often I say my mind works like a prairie dog tunnel. And if you're not familiar with prairie dogs, they um, dig a lot of tunnels in their ecosystem. And so you may think you're on a path towards a, one singular destination and you get caught up in multiple pathways um, that arise. Or there's a lot of friends in those tunnels. And so you get distracted and held up a little bit. But nonetheless, my pursuit for ed equity really began um, in college because I came to Nebraska UNL specifically for dental a program in dental hygiene. And when I got into that class, the classroom spaces there, I realized that I was finding my voice, a voice that was silenced and um, the context behind that silence will come to light in a few moments. But really in that space, I realized that my path is not dental hygiene. My path was um, in advocacy and education. Um, and that's kind of where that happened. But fast forward, um, I, was a, I became a mother at the age of 17. And today, right before this, we, I joke with my son. My oldest son is with me today, which is a full circle coming back to Omaha. So um, he's, he is 18, almost 19 years old. Um, and he's a freshman in college and I celebrate the fact that he is in college he doesn't have any children and he's um, he has some really solid plans for his future but right before we got here it was really humbling because he said mom um, he said how did you get to where you are today and so I look over at him and I um, like among the things I celebrate about myself, my amazing sense of humor is among the top. Just kidding. But I said, well, son, I started from the bottom. Now I'm here. And then he was like, oh, geez. So we didn't go into further depth. But I joke that like that could be the entrance song when we come in today. Um, and he's em embarrassed that I'm calling him out right now. So I'll refrain from doing that. But one of the things, um, the most humbling experiences I had in advocacy came when I was a mother. And it, being a mother of students whose academic experiences were not consistent with my own, I consider myself to be an expert hoop jumper, meaning that I was able to navigate systems and processes um, just because I was compliant, right, all throughout my K through 12th grade experience. So I, that came very easily. And for students who, in my mind, um, transcend the ability to be compliant, it's a lot more difficult and the road is a lot harder. There um, are a lot more obstacles and without adults and mentors in their lives equipped with the knowledge and skills to navigate those barriers, they often fall through the cracks. So the journey to where I am currently in back home in South Dakota really started, um, I left NICE in 2017 and it was really sad because I left a family that I cultivated here in Omaha. I really thank my Omaha relatives who have really become extended members of my family. Um, but when I moved home, I entered the Rapid City Public School District. So this was my hometown community. Um, as Barbara mentioned, I'm Oglala Lakota, and over here I was a bit like a visitor among tribal and indigenous communities that laid claim to the land long before um, any other Nebraska residents. However, moving home is a different beast. There's that, there's the slogan, um, you're not a prophet in your own home, and that holds true, and it's wrought with a lot of challenges. But I remember when my I was three months into my job there and there was a school district, or not a school district, excuse me, a community civic leader. And she came and she said, Sarah, um, we have this really exciting opportunity to take a group of cross sector, um, culturally diverse leaders uh, in the city of Rapid City to the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, California. And we're going to discuss race relations at the Museum of Tolerance. And so we, I was, I was very reluctant because I thought, well, that seems a little antithetical, especially because we're in the heart of where the indigenous genocide occurred, right here in the Black Hills and the Hesapa. 
Um, but reluctantly, I obliged and I went and it ended up becoming not only the most transformative professional experience of my life, but really catalyzed um, the personal healing that I didn't even know I needed at that time. So we got to the Museum of Tolerance. There were, I want to say, about 35 of us. And we were immersed in this very thoughtful um, experience at this Museum of Tolerance, which is the Holocaust Museum, the Jewish Holocaust Museum. Um, and we went through this very intentional um, tour of the museum. It was very well narrated. We got multiple perspectives. And then we got to the end um, and there was this gas chamber simulator. And I remember um, just being among all of these leaders, many of whom I met was meeting for the first time on that trip. And we, the doors closed, you heard the gas chamber um, and this, the eerie music that I could still hear. And then we got out of the simulator and we got to this other exhibit that I wasn't really expecting, but it was all about Liberation Day. So over the loudspeaker, you could hear the world, the world, uh, the war has ended. Um, you are all free. And then on the wall, there were these TVs and they had different survivor accounts. So on one of them, there was a woman and she said at the time of her liberation, she was 26 years old. And when they announced liberation, she went running and she was she had a daughter who was six years old at the time. And so she went running in search of her daughter. And she said, when I finally saw her, she was curled up against this barbed wire fence in a little ball, sobbing this most gut wrenching cry that I could still hear today. And she said, so when I saw her, I did what any mother would have done. I ran to her, I picked up my baby, I put her on my lap and we cried together the most liberating cry we ever had in our lives. And she said, when we cried until we couldn't cry anymore, we got up, we walked out and we started our liberation day together. And it was in that moment, it was like a light bulb turned on for the first time and I realized that in many cases, my mother, um, both of my grandmas and um, the, my great grandma were denied a liberation day. Um, my grandmas were had pleasant experiences in their boarding school career and they would tell stories that were very fond recollections of being with their cousins and relatives. But one thing that happened as a result of that experience was neither of them spoke our language, neither of them practiced our traditional belief systems. Um, they they denounced a lot of our, our who, what it meant to be Lakota as a result of the colonization. And while a lot of what they taught me through their resilience and compassion was in stark contrast to what I was experiencing in that moment, I realized that my purpose was to reclaim what was lost um, so that my, myself and my future generations didn't have to suffer um, with that trauma in mind. And in many cases, that my mom and my aunts could also experience that same liberation day um, because it's the nations were carried by our women. The women were overburdened in every nation um, with the responsibility of sustaining our culture and our, our people. And so I really take that really seriously now. And so what was once a really reluctant professional opportunity became the catalyst for a lot of things. And so fast forward, I went back to the school district I started embarking on this very serious um, and fervent professional development path that led me to a, a once in a lifetime fellowship opportunity. And it was through that fellowship that I always say creator will do things in weird, unexpected ways. And so if you're not going to act on your own accord, he's going to put you in a corner and be like, OK, you're not going to do this, but this path is for you. So I'm going to make no other way out. And so and here I am, I finally got the courage to leave the school district because um, in the effort to fight for systemic equity, I realized that the progress of that was going to happen at the speed of molasses in January. And while I don't have direct experience with that, I can only imagine what it's like. Um, so I left to, and I joined a nonprofit organization called Indian Collective, and that's where I began my role as director of ed equity. And then through that, we started convening um, a stakeholder group, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, for those of you, we'll get to um, lovely Governor Noam momentarily, but this education equity, we're on it campaign is a spinoff of her slogan, her, the very infamous slogan that you may have caught 
probably more specifically on an SNL skit. Um, the South Dakota rolled out a slogan called meth, we're on it, um, which was a slogan to address the drug issues, but we ended up becoming one of the laughing stocks of the nation for that. Um, and then right there, the little girls in the corner on the far right are just kind of personifies the fight where that we're hoping to reverse um, the colonization and the weaponization that the education system has on our people. Um, there are three primary outcomes that I hope you take away with, with today. Um, one of them is that tribal consultation is essential. And this isn't just specific to people who are working with high concentrations of indigenous people. In my opinion, tribal consultation is essential for all sectors of our community. Um, and we, I will talk about that inherent responsibility to do diligence for our indigenous people regardless of where we reside. Um, the second would be to honor indigenous education practitioners and leaders in state decision making. So that means having authentic Native American voices at these tables, not people who are speaking on our behalf, rather people who are from the community making decisions for the community and ultimately making decisions on, be on behalf of people that will also be impacted by those decisions in the same way. And then finally, Indigenous ed is not a burden of responsibility um, that should lie exclusively on Indigenous shoulders. It's a collective responsibility and it's very an, an inclusive effort for all moving parts. And I will get to that. Um, regardless of what sector of the community you work, there is an opportunity to be a part of this movement. So we'll start this really quick with a quick video clip. This was at a recent, um, these two girls, they're middle school students in South Dakota, but they opened up um, with this prayer song at a, an event we have, well, not an event, but a public hearing in response to um, our newly adopted social study standards. So we'll open with them. <laughs> So the the young lady in the green um, who came in a little ways into the song, she's actually a senior at Lakota Tech High School on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And recently there was a really beautiful feature written about her. So after this, if you um, follow us on LinkedIn, our coalition page or um, on Facebook, you'll find a link to that write up about her. It's, it's very inspirational. It talks about her intended trajectory as an advocate and what inspired her um, to get into that space. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we all have a unique and inherent responsibility to honor and identify the indigenous um, inhabitants of the land that we benefit from. Um, everywhere we go, it doesn't matter where we are in the United States, um, we are on indigenous land. Um, re and so regardless if we're indigenous or not, we all benefit from the theft of indigenous land. And I don't say that in, um, I say that in a way because I acknowledge the fact that the theft of indigenous land ultimately led to the post-secondary institutions that I, that afforded me opportunity. And so to honor the inhabitants is something that we should all seek to do re in every sector of our community. So opening up with just the public awareness of whose land are we on, 
um, and how how do the inhabitants, the original inhabitants of the land, continue to be stewards of this land and community? And so with that, um, the Native Governance Center has a really amazing toolkit for organizations to create not only a land acknowledgement, but um, a pathway to go beyond the land acknowledgement and do more for the community, serving the community. So I have on there um, the Bluebird Cultural Initiative. So if you don't know much about them, I would take some time to Google them after this. Um, they're doing some really amazing work in the community. But it's really critical when you think about going beyond the land acknowledgement to not only identify native serving orgs, but native led native serving orgs. And there's a huge difference between the two. Um, through the, the efforts that we, so, let me back up a little bit. When I started as, um, when I left the school system, we really left to convene to champion a bill for school choice. So like Nebraska, we don't have charter school legislation. And so that creates um, a barrier to an otherwise school choice opportunity that could benefit a lot of BIPOC students, especially Native American students. Um, through our three years of legis failed legislative attempts, um, we had Senator Heiner, who was an enrolled member of the Sichangu Lakota tribe. Um, he sponsored our bill. Um, he gave a really amazing testimony. But one of the most compelling that holds true to our advocacy efforts is the thing that has always been missing in Indi Indian education and is still missing is the Indian. And there's a lot of different aspects that that is um, held true. But um, in South Dakota specifically, we'll talk about that. But I wanted to um, defer to a little bit more of, of our student expertise, and then we'll continue our conversation. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hans Fuller. Um, I'm a junior at Lakota Tech. I'm also a vice president. Uh, I'm 17 years old. I'm Ogallalasu. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge whose land we stand on today. This land belongs to indigenous people. Therefore, our history deserves to be taught within schools that sit upon our land. Erasure. That's what comes to mind when thinking about how this country has treated and continues to treat indigenous people. When I think of my people, I think of how beautiful and how powerful we truly are. This attempt at erasure has caused us to lose sight in our way of life. This effect has took a tremendous toll on, uh, on our indigenous people. Please consider the families and the people this will affect because it overlooks native people in today's society. This land is built and founded on not only the erasure, but also the genocide of native people. <laughs> there may be a long road of reparations ahead of us in order to heal this deep wound, but we can start by adjusting the new curriculum standards. Be sta we can start adjusting the new curriculum standards to be fair to native people. <laughs> what I want for our future generation is to feel like they can do anything disregarding what happened to us. This generational trauma only goes so far and will break out of it. But in order for that to happen, we'll need to, the social study standards to be changed, educate everyone in South Dakota about the topic. Lastly, I want you all to know that Native American history is an American history. How? Etu yellow. How do you say it? Etu yellow. So this was a student um, who is now a senior, but this was in response to the social study standards, which at that time were being heard through a public hearing in Pierre, South Dakota at our state capitol. Unfortunately, following um, this public testimony, they were passed and adopted. And so part of the reason why we exist today is to challenge um, the systemic oppression in the form of different content standards implementation. And so we'll get to that in a second. And I keep, I know I keep deferring these topics to later in the presentation, but I promise we will get back to them. So this was during, in, at the height of COVID during legislative session. But really what happened when I mentioned we got together as a group of native um, teachers, principals, family members, et cetera. And we started talking about championing that school choice bill that Senator Heiner carried for us. And the goal in South Dakota at the time, charter, charter schools was a really hot button topic that um, threatened a lot of our public school systems. And so really what we were, what we were desiring was a smaller model of community 
um, schools that were designed with the community for the community. Um, and we convened for three years. We ran that bill for three different years. And at the conclusion, like, because it was it failed three times it could be described as a colossal failure however the unintended byproduct which has become the fruit of our labor so far was we created a, sa a container of safety for a lot of our native um, teachers administrators and parents to come together and talk very candidly ver um, vulnerably and openly about the issues that our students faced in classrooms across south dakota and the safety came because Teachers, the community could really be honest about this in our space, um, and they didn't have any fear of punitive repercussion as a result of that truth. And so, what we realized is we need a whole, we need this container to continue. And so, after after um, the third legislative session, we pivoted away from school choice legislation because we realized we also needed to humanize the experience because in South Dakota the experience of indigenous ed is not humanized to the fidelity that it deserves right now. And so um, the coalition was born in its formal capacity two years ago, and we've been growing since. Um, but we have what's called a North Star retreat twice a year to identify the priorities of our work that really guide us, so um, hence the North Star. So we really wanted to harness the power and I, that power should be the capital P to, for, parent, for parents, community and um, families to recognize their ability to make this movement happen. Um, we want to advocate for access um, so our students have an increased opportunity to learn their language, to learn our cultural ways and that be very present within the school environments. Um, we also wanted to support the treaty rights of our students. We have a lot of um, our schools on reservation lands. We have nine reservations in South Dakota. So we wanna make sure that the state recognizes the sovereign status of our tribal nations. And that comes before the state um, sovereignty suppression comes in because we saw a lot of that, unfortunately, in the height of COVID. Um, and then always we wanna honor the seven generations that came before us. So we really stand on the shoulders of our predecessors, um, and then also want to be good stewards for the future generations that are coming to occupy these spaces too. Um, so that's where the coalition was born. We've, we started like it was a very informal group. I remember we sat around a, a little dining room table having like candid conversations. There was like 10 of us. Now we've grown to um, a good consistent base of about 25 to 30 who meet weekly. And then at our larger North Star convenings, we have 50 to 75 participants there. And then um, we have a host of others who follow the efforts share but they're not actively engaged for whatever reason. Um, but the reason why we do what we do is because you will see um, the data doesn't lie. There's a black and white accounts across the United States that tell us that the US education system isn't meant um, for, or is not, in my opinion, is not reflective of the abilities and genius of our, that our indigenous students bring to the table. Not only that, but when we look at school districts across the United States, um, especially in South Dakota, when I was in Rapid City, we had um, our student population ranged between 23 to 27% roughly, and our staff population, which was inclusive of certified and classified staff, um, was under 2%. So students were not only seeing them, they were not only not seeing themselves reflected in our content, in our classrooms, in our environments, but they were not even seeing our people reflected in their school system and occupying professional spaces. And so when you think about that, when you think about that lack of exposure, um, it only creates self-fulfilling prophecies that make it seem virtually impossible to aspire for greatness. And then um, when you have a system that seems to feel that it's actively working against our value system, um, we just have a perfect storm that's being perpetuated. One of the challenges, so South Dakota also has what we call the Ocheti Shakoin Essential Understandings. Um, that is a set of content standards that was designed to be infused in social studies exclusively, but there are many unique ways to um, to make that inclusive across all content areas. But 
they were adopted by the state, recognized by the state, but unfortunately they're um, an elective at best and they're an un unfunded mandate because it's left, because South, South Dakota prioritizes local control at its convenience. And so when they wanna push something like our social studies content standards, um, which are rolling out courtesy of Hillsdale College, um, when they, and I'm very facetious sometimes too when I get passionate, so excuse that. But when they roll those out in 2025, um, they said, fear not because we have this grant that we are going to standardize textbooks for everyone's implementation. Um, and those, this textbook standardization is not inclusive of indigenous community or other BIPOC community members that are imperative to the development of that, um, those resources. And so, they prioritize local control when it comes to stopping indigenous led initiatives and that's what it feels like, but they prioritize systemic um, textbook adoption when they're pushing initiatives that are led um, by the governor's office, which has been a really unique challenge. So what we really found was in our efforts of convening is the fight was the, and I don't even like using the word fight because I'm in this era of peace and love and I don't like the word fight, but the active resistance against the ed system is f so that students have access um, to a true, and what is true indigenous ed? Um, because schooling is a lot different than what education is. And schooling prior to the boarding school process was a lot different. It was very um, dependent on lifestyle and the, main, the maintenance of our societies. Um, as I mentioned before, in order to push for more opportunities to get indigenous education on the ground, we had these bills. And the first one in 2019, they called it the Lazarus Bill because we did our diligence with that. We actually went to the State Department of Ed. We said, hey, we have a group of indigenous um, educators who want to push this bill. Um, how can we get, gain your support? What elements would be compelling for you to support? They closed the door. They didn't want to work with us. We got to the Senate Ed Committee. Um, senator Heiner gave the testimony. Every single senator in that space admitted that we aren't doing enough, we are failing. This this achievement gap has been historic. We don't know the answer, but this isn't it. Um, so it failed. However, th the chair of the committee at the time said, wait a minute, we all just sat here and listened to each other talk about how the system is failing. We have a group of people who are from the native community proposing a solution. Um, I request that DOE, the Department of Ed, we'll work with this group to come up with a bill that you all can feel good about and then bring it back to committee next week. So this was like a the ultimate Hail Mary bill. We went back, we spent four hours with the Department of Ed. Um, they were not extremely enthusiastic in this space, but they did finally come out with a bill that they were able to at least agree with. We passed through the Ed Committee and passed on the Senate floor unanimously. And then we died in the House Education Committee um, at the opposition of one of our tri well, our tribally based public schools, which was a huge heartbreak, but also speaking of cultural proficiency, highlighted the issues that exist at the systemic level because we heard we heard some of the House committee members say, this is an Indian bill and these the, basically these Indians can't get along to bring this bill. They don't even agree on it. Um, and so that was really problematic. Went back, did a lot more education. Um, DOE, with, even though we brought the same bill back, DOE pulled their endorsement even th though they helped co-write it at the time. Um, then we failed on the Senate floor. And then year three, we passed in the Senate um, and then we failed in the House committee. But in this time, I will say the strength of our coalition has really been not in the strength of numbers that exist within our organization, but the strength in numbers that exist within um, our coalition partners. So in that span of time, the three years, um, some of the other unintended byproducts of success were A, we, we had Indian Ed on the forefront of conversations and tables and spaces that were not historically happening. Two, our largest school districts began to panic thinking, okay, what can we do to increase our accountability measures to show that we are being diligent in our efforts to be more inclusive? And then three, um, our people or our members of the coalition began to say, okay, how can we build momentum to prove 
to our elected officials that we're not just sitting here waiting we're not sitting here complacent waiting on a bill to save us we're actively creating solutions that could be tried and implemented when the bill does pass so since then two schools have been launched in south dakota um there were there are a couple more but the two that i'm specifying are directly in concert with our efforts one is the Wakanyeja Tokeachi. It's housed in um, Rosebud, South Dakota. And the other is the Ocheti Shakoin Community Academy in Rapid City, which are culturally immersive private schools in South Dakota that came as a result of these efforts um, in partnership with the Naka Inspired Schools Network. And so they're right now they're solely reliant on fundraising and philanthropy, but one day we hope to create a mechanism so that they are financially sustainable in the future. Um, so fast forward this year, um, we pivoted, we're no longer pushing a bill. In fact, there's not a real strong appetite for that in the administration that we currently have. However, what we are trying to do is push for more consultation to be happening with our tribes. The women in this picture represent some of our tribal education departments and they've been there for quite some time and they are um, frankly uh, overburdened with the amount of responsibilities that they have um, but their their premise is to really uphold that sovereignty and that collaboration that exists between the government um, governor Christy Noem her very first executive order in office was she actually removed our South Dakota Department of Education out of the South Dakota Department of Ed and she placed it under the purview of tribal relations so to a lot of our education leaders this was a, a blatant act of segregation in our schools and advocacy for our schools um, her justification was this movement would enable um, tribal oversight the problem with that, we have nine tribes in South Dakota. When I served as um, the director of Indian Ed for the Rapid City School District, we had 69 tribal nations represented in our school district. So that's 60 other nations outside of South Dakota that were seeking services in South Dakota. Not only that, every single native student in my school district at the time was a non-tribally living student. And so therefore, the Office of Tribal Relations purview did not include them. And that would have been the same for Sioux Falls and any other non-tribally based town. Um, so there were a lot of there's are a lot of students being underserved by this movement. This executive order still stands. And I also want to tell you that the three years that we ran the school choice bill are we actually also ran another bill to reverse this executive order, which was endorsed by all nine tribal nations in our state. Um, and uh, the Department of Ed still said no. And their response is always um, give it time or no, that's not going to work. So it's the consistent systemic. We know what's better for you than you all know what's best. Anyone who doesn't um, isn't familiar with why a student wouldn't be supported by a tribe. Could you explain that to the audience here and Zoom who oh. are zooming in? Why why would there be students in Rapid City Public Schools and Omaha Public Schools who don't have support of their tribes? Well, are, we are, have. I mean, we have our there the inner tribal diversity that exists in the United States reflects that more than two thirds of indigenous students are actually attending school off the reservation. A lot of the federal money that comes to support reservations are primarily for reservation dwelling inhabitants. So it doesn't cover costs or um, support for people living off the reservation. Not only that, but the levels of support vary exponentially. And so the levels of support that we see with some tribes are not equitable across the board for different treaty matters so that's a very thank you that's a loaded question i feel like we need a whole um we need a college course you, for that and i think what you provided can at least give people a a, a picture of that mm -hmm. as well as those students who because of blood quantum oh. and all that can't even qualify for any Oh yes, and then there are tribes without federal recognition. So I will say the Title VI Indian Ed program is um, in my mind a reparation. So 
education is a treaty right for native students regardless of what tribe they come from in exchange for the land that was taken we were promised um health care education and um i'm drawing the blank on the third one Healthcare care ed and yes thank you so public safety and so we have so beyond that because free free comes with a lofty price tag and i digress that's another um that's a conversation for another entire class as well but i will say that due to different federal and tribal regulations um not all students are enrolled not all students who identify as indigenous are enrolled but in south dakota specifically we do have a great deal of students who are enrolled members of their tribal communities without adequate advocacy because there's no um, mechanism or department housed in DOE. Right now we also, the challenge that we have right now is our secretary, while our secretary of tribal relations is indigenous, he does not have support from any tribes in South Dakota to speak on our behalf. And then furthering the challenge, the um, appointed director of Indian Ed is a non-indigenous male with no pre-K through 12th grade experience or background. Um, when asked why he wanted to obtain the position, he said that his parents were entering an elderly stage in their life and he wanted to move back to South Dakota. So that is the very transparent level of commitment that we have um, in our offices at this time. So the one thing that um, makes the coalition really unique is um, in, a, in our latest North Star retreat, one of the elders in our community identified us and this was a really humble identification she said the coalition really gets to be the iapaha of indian ed in south dakota and iapaha is the announcer the mc of a powwow usually um but we get to elevate and say things that a lot of people who fear job security don't have the ability to say um and then they can we can share things in solidarity under the safety of the coalition and so that really helps c create a lot more momentum. Um, this march right here was the Ochati Shakoin March for Our Children. This came in response to the very first launch of those proposed social study standards. Um, the beautiful thing about this is all nine tribal nations showed up to the state capitol. Um, you'll see that our march was led by primarily by students um, representing all different nations, and it poured the entire day and all the people remain for the whole day. So there was a lot of beauty in it. There was one of the elders in the community said it's it's symbolic of the resilience that we will have to have to continue this fight, um, which is I also think is very humbling and promising. Um, and then I mentioned our youth engagement strategy. Last year, we had the opportunity to take a group of youth um, and you'll see Hans there. He was on the video earlier and then there's Paula on the left there, but she, um, they were able to do a student panel about culturally responsive education for native students and their answers blew me away i feel like they could really take the lead and teach us and in fact when our when we uh, many of our coalition members were present in the audience in peer when the south dakota decided to adopt the social studies content standards and these students were also in the audience but it was the adults in the coalition that left with a heart full of discouragement and defeat. But it was the it was the youth that were like, OK, that that passed. But what are we doing next? Like, what can we do next and how are we going to go about it? So they really bring this breath of energy that we need. And it really holds true to the fact that it's important to honor that not only um, our ancestors, but the generations that are coming because um, they we are really leading by example. So when I mentioned how to join the movement, so say you're not in the field of education, your um, professional purview doesn't lend itself to making those efforts, I mean, moving that needle in the education space, there are ways to start increasing awareness because I think that a lot of the challenges that we see systemically are due to a lack of awareness, well, A, but a lack of well, the, co the consistent erasure and then just the ignorance that exists in the spaces. So in order to join the movement from a professional setting, and this is encouraged by the Native Governor, Governance Center, to always think about whose land am I actively benefiting from? Where is my home community, my work community, the communities that I'm occupying? 
whose land, who were the original stewards of that land and how did they steward that space? Um, and then we think about this, am I aware of the narratives of landmarks in my city? We see this in the Black Hills specifically. Um, everyone comes to the Black Hills to see Mount Rushmore. The absent narrative of Mount Rushmore um, represents, from our people, represents the ultimate sign of conquering and colonization. So our most sacred, our sacred hills decimated by the construction of these forefathers. And if you look at the specific actions of each of the forefathers, many of whom had an atrocious impact on native communities. Um, so th there is that, and that's another class as well. We could talk all day about um, appropriation of different landmarks and, and points in our communities. Um, question, am, am I appropriating or appreciating culture? And that goes to all cultures, not just natives. Um, am I hiring indigenous consultants and entrepreneurs? Am I looking for them? And then am I voting against Indian country? And a way to think about that, if you don't know how elected officials prioritize sovereignty or self-determination, then chances are we are voting against it. Because if we don't know the explicit official stance, then often they're not supporting Indian country or they're just unknowingly um, suppressing sovereignty in some form. And then do we talk about the ways in which our organizations, especially our long-standing orgs, have, may have harmed, whether intentionally or unintentionally harmed indigenous populations? And these conversations are really hot button topics, especially in institutions back home that have historically been imposed on the people, but now have come to be, become sources of healing for people. But we often shy away from having the critical conversation about harm um, because we, in our own unhealing, we can't unpack that to the way that we, the way that we need to, to move forward. And then finally, um, one, uh, some other things you can do to get involved in education is um, we all have access to students in some way, shape or form, whether they're our own children, our relatives, but do we have a Title VI Indian Ed program in our school district? And then um, what kind of, kinds of tribal consultation are happening within those spaces? Um, does, our, does our organization or business have a land acknowledgement? Was it, and then this is the other thing, it's if your or if your institution does not have a land acknowledgement, it's not really appropriate to go to the tribal nations of the land you occupy and say, "Hey, we want you to write a land acknowledgement." It's about us doing our diligence, our homework, and crafting something that's reflective of the values that our organization has. And then, how can we not just say that we are on this land, but how can we go beyond that? How are we inviting? Um, indigenous-led nonprofits into our space to work in collaboration. How are we supporting the mission of our indigenous-led nonprofit entities advance their work in our communities that we serve? Um, and then thinking about who our contractors are, how the contractors may or not be stewarding the land that we're on. And then has our professional development included indigenous practitioners? And I think this is really important, especially especially if we don't have um, demographics reflective of high concentrations of Native people, because when we don't know, we don't know. And so having that um, from the original stewards is really important. This reminds me of a conversation that you and I had this morning, and we don't need to mention the name of the institution, but when you were working on your master's degree, the, the feedback that you got back on some of the projects that you were proposing could you talk about oh, that yeah. a little bit because it seems very related yeah i think um thank you for bringing that up i think uh, barbara was mentioning her experience in college and talking about um the lack of cultural proficiency that was witnessed um with her with her professors and i mentioned that the cultural proficiency hasn't vastly improved in the same institution in fact when I was in my graduate um, program, we had to design this huge unit plan. And at, I brought my unit plan, um, which I felt was very consistent. It was not what 
um, was deemed an American classic. It was Sherman Alexie. And I remember being in there and the teacher, the professor said, well, this would be great if you're doing a unit for Native American Heritage Month. And I'm like, uh, no, this is a unit appropriate for all year round. And there are ways to infuse multiple cultures through a lens of perspective. And so that's just kind of, I mean, not only are our students challenged in their in their edu elementary and secondary classrooms, but in our post-secondary institutions. And without um, that sphere of relevance and context, it's really hard without the heart of an advocate to push through that because those systemic barriers are made us made to feel like we need to accommodate the system. And that's something that I've learned not to do. Um, in fact, I have, I mentioned that my son was here and sorry, Thomas, I'm gonna call you. <laughs> I'm not calling you out specifically, but through his, Thomas was a, is a very great natured boy. He has a lot of really strong leadership qualities um, and he has ADHD. So when we navigated through his elementary and middle school career, um, we would get into classrooms and the teachers would begin with, Thomas is a gr really good natured boy. He talks a lot, he's very active. And it would be this laundry list of things that Thomas needed to, uh, uh, improve upon and so that became exhausting for me because um as a mom you like i can recognize the leadership qualities and assets that he brings to a space and so i started creating my own graphic organizers and i would take them into conferences and i'm like i know what you're going to say but let's start off with the three qualities that he brings into the classroom then they would identify some of the challenges and then i would say okay what interventions have you employed so far and how can we work together to ensure that we're seeing him be successful? Because that's my ultimate um, desire. And so some teachers were more forgiving than others in those spaces, but ultimately it, it really helped me. It helped me understand the level and, and of hoops that I continue to jump for my son's um, success, but also made me recognize the barriers that stand in the way of parents who don't understand their rights within the system and the demands that they can make and the things that they don't have to agree to but they do because they feel that it's compulsory um, and so that's the unfortunate reality in many cases and this is just a qr code to our website i will tell you full disclosure our website is undergoing a facelift and we are not that um, mobile friendly at this time however we will be soon um, but the web, the the domain will stay the same. And I just wanted to conclude with any questions we have about fifteen minutes, and I will entertain questions. And you can ask anything; it's not offensive to me. So, hello, my name is Weishel. Um, I'm curious about um, with Native Americans having their own autonomy. How does that work uh, with civic engagement? So, like, is I mean, do you vote for this, whatever area you're in, do you like just vote for whoever is running or like, how does all of that work? Oh my gosh, I love this question. <laughs> we actually, what we found through our navigation of these systems, which were ultimately foreign because of the active disengagement of tribal communities, that's a digression too. But one thing we saw was that our state elected officials, there's a miss, there's, there's no communication happening between our tribal governments and our state government right now. And as tribal citizens, we are duly enrolled, so we can vote for state elections, we can vote for federal elections, and we have unique opportunities to vote for our sovereign tribal elections as well. If we're reservation, well, it's on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the tribe. I can't vote right now in tribal elections back home because I don't live on the res right now. Um, but what we're seeing is um, because of the lack of consultation and speaking that's happening, there's a lot of individuals who are occupying the spaces making decisions that are a direct suppression of sovereignty. And so what we're trying to do with, we have um, a new youth civic engagement program launched now, and we're working in partnership with three different school districts. Two of them are reservation based, one of them is in Rapid City. And the hope is to be able to identify where the gaps are and community access to information that would get them to be civically engaged. So um, there's always the question, well, natives don't vote, natives are disengaged, but it's been systemically and actively disengaged. Um, it's not because they're not interested. 
they don't want to they just don't understand the value of the vote and their the ability to influence change that happens there um, additionally when i was talking about covid for instance our governor was the one who believed that she would impose no mandates on community for public safety during covid however because covid was really disproportionately harming um, in, or affecting indigenous people at a rate that was excessively higher than our non-indigenous counterparts. A lot of our tribal councils made the decision to close down our reservations, put travel restrictions. They would not let outsiders come onto the res. Um, and in one of our tribes, our larger tribes in the north, um, one of the roads was actually a public highway. And so they had roadblocks where they were like actively questioning over where people were going. Um, and Governor Nome took many attacks to disband that that went against tribal sovereignty. The other thing is on our res on the Pine Ridge Reservation, um, they had a shelter in place mandate that meant everyone had to stay home and all business was to be conducted on Zoom. However, our Oglala Lakota County School District, which is a public school district funded by the state of South Dakota, since they had an open door policy, they said that's at the discretion of the school district which was a, a huge form of sovereignty suppression because the school, although it was on tribal lands and should honor what the tribe was saying, the state was telling them otherwise. And so there's this active tension that exists there because there's a lack of knowledge um, and maybe a, maybe a willful lack of knowledge too. But we see a lot of those issues come into play. Um, and so the hope is to, with our civic engagement program is to um, identify a, a curriculum that would address both tribal sovereignty and tribal government, state government, and create pathways for them to connect and collaborate. Does that answer your question? Okay. Welcome back, Sarah. You remember Thank me? You. Yes. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, I was I seen an episode of uh, on Ghosts. I don't, I don't know when it came, but they talked about acknowledgement. Land and is not on our hands as indigenous people. It's on non-native people's hands. Mm -hmm. We ought to be in a realm of welcoming, you know, welcoming speech. Welcome to the Umaha land, so to say. What is your thoughts on that? Is that, that, is that, is that about right? That is a hundred percent in alignment. So it's, yeah, it's not the responsibility of the indigenous community to create the land acknowledgement rather um, the orgs and institutions benefiting from that land to do their diligence and offer that back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, cause I've been asked to do some acknowledgements, uh, you know, as I get older, you know, it's not too many people that's native men or just in general. So it's not really my lane it was really my brother that passed. It's really his lane. So, but you know, in our culture, we, we ain't, we ain't supposed to turn down nothing or whatnot. But I just want to kind of get somebody's opinion in that. Yeah. Uh, I, I was thinking of some other stuff, but I think of it in a minute. It's good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Sarah, welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be back. Um, full disclosure, she was also my boss at one point. So yeah. it was a pleasure to work with her. While she was at OPS, we did a Making Invisible History Visible. And that happened here on Metro's campus. So I thought maybe you could speak to that since our location and since we're focused on education and how important that was to the kids. I love that. We actually, so the, if you all haven't explored that, OPS still has a website and resources of making invisible histories visible. And we um, they're reflective of all different um, parts of Omaha, but mostly the BIPOC communities that exist. Um, one in particular that we'd need to take note of how um, transit systems affected displacement. So not only did colonization come and displace Native people, but we think about Jefferson Square, which was downtown by the, um, what is the center? I'm drawing a blank. The event center downtown where Jefferson the Square. Civic yeah. That one, but there's there's one that's still standing by the overpass, the big event center. Uh, Thank you. A bit, I've been away for a long time. <laughs> yes. And so the, the overpass, when they created the transit system, the I-80, well, I whatever it is. Thank you, 480. Um, the, the commune, there was once a native community there called Jefferson Square. And there's actually an ebook 
on that website that talks about that. Um, but students got to really um, dig in and do their research in, con in conjunction with the archives and learn all about those spaces. We also took students um, to Genoa Indian School, which was one of the closest boarding schools um, to the Omaha metro area. And the really amazing thing about that is with our native students, I feel like it was a form of rec um, reclamation and also a visible reminder of the trauma that affects their societies today. It was like um, the incubator of where that began. But for our non-Indigenous students, they were blown away. Like we're not teaching this um, to the fidelity that it could be taught in our ed system. So many of the students, this was our very first exposure and they're like, what? these native boarding schools happen here. And so they were able to do their research, b physically be in the space at Genoa to feel the presence. If you all haven't been there, I would highly encourage you to visit. Um, it's stewarded by the community and there are a lot of artifacts there um, that paint a vivid picture of, of what happened. But those are among two very notable. We also had some of your relatives give some interviews, um, the Mitchells give some interviews about um, language revitalization efforts and things like that. Thank you, that was a fruitful experience and I think it was in the renovated, was there a renovated barn? Is that what where we were at? Yes. The mule barn? Mule barn. <laughs> yes, so. So I work with a nonprofit, uh, the Nebraska Civic Engagement Table. Mm. And we recently did a member summit in Columbus, Nebraska, and we wanted to do the whole land acknowledgement, and we did. However, we really wanna know how to go past the land acknowledgement mm -hmm. and be more inclusive and take the information that we have and get it to the uh, Native American community so we can see them um, increase their voter participation. So how do we go about making that happen? I think depend the first of all going beyond the land acknowledgement, being able to identify first if there's any um, mission aligned organizations doing similar work. I can tell you there's probably not in the realm of civic engagement, but I would reach out to the councils. Many councils are broken down in subcommittees and they would usually have a governance committee and an education committee. And those would be two spaces that I would tap into because then they will bring you um, the right people to the table and the right um, information that you would want to bridge that gap there. So I would start with the, the, the tribal communities of the land you're on and their committees. And um, also change happens at the speed of trust. And so generally it's not going to be ultra successful just to go in and do a presentation about what your needs are and expect the jump on. I think you need to show a commitment. Well, any org that wants to work in collaboration needs to show an ongoing commitment to the community that's non-extractive, that's reciprocal. And so showing up at community-led events, um, powwows, like any culture events at school, things like that would really like heighten your visibility but increase um, the will willingness to trust. I enjoyed your presentation. Do you present in... Uh... For other orgs like yes i will i'm interested i would gladly do that yeah okay thanks i'll need your business card then okay all right thank you thank you okay thomas gets to talk. oh uh, oh <laughs> so when you started working at ops and you you are where you are today would you do anything would you go back and do anything differently oh that's a really great question thank you um so this is like an emotional question, I feel, because when I talk about how the professional development experience really changed the trajectory of my personal development and the healing journey I've been on since from that Museum of Tolerance trip, I think in looking back, because of my expert, I'm the eldest daughter also, so eldest daughter, um, just wanting to comply and overperform a lot of times, I think I pursued professional success to the detriment of my time in my personal life. And so if I could go back, I would devote more time to being a mom and like being more present in your lives and be with family and loved ones. I still have, a, I still struggle with that. Um, 
And so thank you for the opportunity to acknowledge that. And yeah, I think that's the one thing. But otherwise, like on the professional landscape, no. These are awesome questions, aren't they? I always find the Q&A really, really um, opens up more more information. So if anybody else has any other questions, Sarah said it doesn't matter what you ask. Maybe I should check the chat. I will say though, um, be like, so it's from the sounds of it, the glimpse or the lens that you're seeing into my professional career makes it seem like I'm just out here rabble rousing a lot, which to some degree I am. But a lot of it too is like when I say trust, I mean, change happens at the speed of trust. I also um, do a lot to show my commitment to the Rapid City community because I don't live on in my tribal community within my tribal community but i'm an indigenous woman living on the ancestral lands of our tribal community but also leadership development and the growth and um cultural proficiency of our city is really near and dear to me and so i spend a lot of time active on different boards and serving multiple aspects of the community and i think for anyone thinking like what can i take away from this that would help me enhance my trajectory is really Think about how can you be, and this is a very overused term, but how can you be a good relative um, to your community that's contributing to community prosperity? What can you do? What skills, talents, time can you devote to an entity or organization that serves community that is mission aligned with your heart and your vocation in life? Because we all have a calling and it's coming from a power greater than ourselves. Um, and I say that with full fidelity. Like we we think when we think we're in control, you just get ready. <laughs> so we do have a question from our Zoom audience. Okay. Are you familiar with UNO's Good Rich program and how successful is that program for inclusiveness? I am familiar with the Good Rich program, but you know what? There are two others in this space who have a lot more extensive experience in preparing students for that. So I would defer to Michaela or Harmon to answer that because their their role in working with it directly has was longer than mine. Um, I would say that it's effective, but it's also not as extensive as we'd like it to be. There was a lot of opportunity there for UNO to do outreach with our community, with the students that we worked with, the NICE program. Unfortunately, the requirements weren't always able to be met and it was such a large competition between all the other students in OPS that sometimes our students were neglected from being in that program. Mm -hmm. Overall, it's an effective program if you can get into it. I just wish there were more access for OPS native students. Thank you for that. That reminds me, there's an opportunity that ex gap that exists with every other system. So I, I get the honor to serve on the Chamber of Commerce in my community, which is called Elevate Rapid City. And we talk about the lack of, um, I shouldn't say the lack of, but the low statistics of native leadership in our community affecting sectors outside of Indian country or indigenous focus initiatives. And I always say this, in our community our communities are set up in circles right and we should often all feel a part of the circle however because our grandparents weren't ever made to feel included in that circle they weren't occupying seats at that table and so the referrals given for their successors are generally not afforded to people in our community and so being able to go out on a limb doing diligence to bring in um, diverse perspectives, not for the purpose of tokenization, but for the purpose of bringing uh, an expanded skill set into your sphere of relevance is really important. And the intentionality of doing that is really key. Um, I recently joined a board and I'm probably like going back on what I just said to Thomas about like, oh, I'll take on less professional, more personal commitments. But um, I accepted a board offer but where they demonstrated the ability to have done their diligence in researching why 
Um, the other thing is, because I know so many of you are professionals in the space, um, you probably know this, but I'm going to reiterate it because it was profound for me. I would always as assume that every opportunity given to me was an honor to me, but I had a mentor who flipped that narrative and was like, no, you add legitimacy to this space. And so with that legitimacy, there's an expenditure of energy um, that comes from you that you need to be considerate of. And so like, it's not, they're not enhancing your life by giving you an opportunity, you're enhancing their space by occupying it. So just thinking about that. Excellent advice. <laughs> mm -hmm. So do we, did we want, okay. Um, there is another question. Do you do your initiatives go beyond social studies? It seems to me literature might be another good avenue for educating students. Oh, wait, they go well beyond social studies. The social studies um, current is a very current event, hot topic in South Dakota right now. And so the the active pursuance of that avenue is extremely critical. Um, we do support student success in all areas, both academically and non academically. One of the most exciting uh, exciting moments this summer we actually um if you're not familiar with this here's another cool thing to youtube um indian relay there's a there was a student team who ran really well in an indian relay in our community and um they were called the makoshicha race team and they were comprised of students who by all definitions didn't fit into the mold of the model student and all of them were very open with the fact that school has been a challenge for us. Um, many of them were on a, an IEP of some sort, but they, they said that racing was the key that kept them involved in school and kept them disciplined enough to remain um, and gave them a point of pride. And so we were able to sponsor some of their events so they could attend and that was one thing um, we were also able to support, support an e-sports competition because we know that research is evolving and highlighting the fact that e-sports is an exceptional tool to increase critical thinking and um, collaboration skills that many of our Native students have a hard time demonstrating in classrooms. And Thomas is shaking his head and he jokes because Thomas is an e-sports competition winner um, when he was in high school. And we he jokes because growing up, um, he said, yeah, I'm doing something that you and my grandma said was a complete waste of my time. But, like, but now we're celebrating that and celebrating that genius. And that's a world that's a little bit foreign for me. But we get the opportunity to support students pursuing different avenues outside of the common athletics that we see. Well, this has just been a wonderful, wonderful time, Sarah. I want to again tell you that Omaha is so happy to have you come back. And it was really nice for you to bring some of your family so we could meet them too. Um, everything that you're doing, I, I think what you did left um, an important mark on Omaha based on the fact that we've got your colleagues who've come back to see you and just learning about it. And um, we're just really thankful that your work continues and I think you were good not to go with dental hygiene or dental <laughs> <laughs> because we love the impact that you're making. <laughs> well, thank you. So, and, and to thank the lovely audience post pandemic, I say that we are <clears throat> working to determine what people want in terms of in-person versus Zoom. It's really, really marvelous that we have technicians who work so hard to make this possible to offer to both audiences. And thanks everybody for being with us today. Thank you.